Okay. And um, as you have seen, we are focusing on chapter three. See if we have any luck uh, to get through the entire chapter. If not, um, obviously we'll uh, get through that next time. Okay. Um, now, looking at these first three parts, and they break them into three parts just because there's a sort of desire to put the information in bite sized pieces. But uh, we will more likely than not get through all three of these parts um, tonight. And um, these three modules really constitute one heavy area on the exam, as I had said at the last uh, meeting that we had, uh, 15 points, okay? Um, it is really focusing on your costs, last managerial accounting. When I say managerial accounting, the part dealing with running costs through your manufacturing entity, running costs through your uh, accounting system. In the far part of the exam, we focus on retail entities, service entities for the most part. On the BEC section, we pick up the notion of the accounting for a manufacturing entity. So we'll spend time with that tonight. And then these last couple of areas that they broke into two parts really have a hodgepodge of different performance tools. A lot of it is ratio analysis, looking at uh, return on assets, that sort of thing. And then um, some of it deals with different definitions, uh, different ways to um, evaluate an entity's performance, both at the entity-wide level, product-wide, and so on. You'll see as we get to that. That is a fairly light area, about five points, but um, we will cover uh, those things maybe tonight, definitely tomorrow. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's start with the discussion of our uh, cost accounting, okay? And when we are talking about cost accounting, one of the things that I think is a little bit difficult when we start talking about manufacturing costs is the different terms and names that are used to really talk about, in many cases, the same thing. So, for example, if you look here, we have something called manufacturing cost. Okay, and our manufacturing costs, okay, consist of direct material, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead. I call that MO, okay, MOH, manufacturing overhead. All three of those are manufacturing costs. Now, you take a look. And you can see here that at the same time, we are calling those same three components that I just laid out to you, we are calling them product costs. And you're like, well, what are they, John? Are they manufacturing costs or their product costs? And what I'm telling you is, yeah, they're both, okay? Just different terms to talk about the same thing. Product costs, manufacturing costs, Direct ma material, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead are all considered product costs, okay? Then just to be annoying, okay, the accounting world has decided that we should call direct labor and factory overhead conversion cost while calling at the same time our direct labor and our direct material prime cost. Now, if this is annoying to you, um, you know, it's annoy it was annoying to me as a student, too. I didn't make this stuff up, guys. This is just the way they've done things for a long, long time before I was even born, okay? So part of the challenge is getting used to the idea, and you can flashcard here, that our product costs, manufacturing costs, are our direct material, direct labor, in our manufacturing overhead, are... Uh, prime cost, our direct materials and direct labor, and then conversion costs in which you're going to convert materials and into product, our direct labor and our factory uh, overhead. And I'm going to show you where I want you to flashcard that a little bit later. Now, when we get to our factory overhead, okay, we're going to see that factory overhead is called in many cases, indirect cost. I want a different color here. 
black I think is better green I'm not in love with green on these it's a nice color but not for writing on the whiteboard here okay these are also called indirect costs now sometimes students have trouble well what are indirect costs well indirect costs are any cost that is too difficult to trace directly to the product so our direct material, our direct labor are fairly easy to track to the material. You know how much wood you use to make a table. You know how much you had to pay a person per hour to put together the table. If it took them two hours, you can trace that pretty easily. But some cost would be uh, indirect, too difficult to trace directly the product. And they have the same name as factory overhead. Indirect cost factory overhead are synonymous terms. And when we talk about indirect costs, and some of it is easy, we have what? We have indirect materials. Okay, indirect materials. Let's go back to that example of the table. While the wood that you use to put together a wooden table might be a direct cost, the glue that you use to put together the table, okay, would probably be an indirect material. Why? It's probably too difficult to measure the glue that you use to put together a table. Does that mean it's impossible? No, you could do it. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to a nice um, lounge, a nice bar or whatever, and you look way up at the top, they have a ladder, and way up there they got this, I think it's the Louis the 15th um, brandy or something. And if anyone ever orders that, the bartender's got to climb up the ladder and then they take out this syringe looking thing and they measure exactly how much of that they're going to serve. And that's what they give you because supposedly this stuff is so good and so expensive. I've never had it. But if we wanted to be that precise with the glue, we could. But the company might determine, well, that difficulty is not worth it to us. So we're going to treat that as to trace directly the product. We're going to treat that as an indirect material. We could have indirect labor. OK, so what would be an example of indirect labor? Well, you know, when the guy is uh, sawing the table, you know, a bunch of sawdust, you know, sanding the table, whatever, a bunch of sawdust goes all over the floor. Well, we need somebody to come around and sweep that up. Well, you know, that cleanup person may be cleaning up all over the factory. And so it's too difficult to trace their time to any one product. So we treat it as an indirect, a supervisor might be indirect. And the supervisor might bounce around to different jobs, supervising, hey, not so much pain, a little more glue, that sort of thing. And so it may be too difficult. So that might be an example of indirect labor. Now, it's pretty easy to understand that indirect materials and indirect labor are indirect because they have the word indirect. But then there's another category of cost, indirect costs that I'll just call the others. Okay, and every time I call it that, it reminds me of that movie with Nicole Kidman where she thought she was being haunted, but she was actually the one that was the ghost and it was really scary. But anyway, the others, okay, what's the name of that movie? The other indirect costs, and I'm just going to give you a listing of ones that you should go ahead and flashcard right here. Example, depreciation. on factory. Think about it. The depreciation on the factory is probably too difficult to trace to any one product. And so we go ahead and we treat that as an indirect cost. Okay. Utilities are indirect. Okay. It might be too difficult to know just exactly how much of the light bill is attributable to any one table that we're building. So utilities trend tend to be indirect. Rent on factory, okay, tends to be indirect. The property taxes on factory, okay, would tend to be indirect. So these are good examples of the others. We don't tend to really, you know, think of those when we think of indirect because indirect material and direct labor are obvious. 
but these others are indirect, okay? Now, when we deal with these indirect costs, we must apply them. We must apply them to any one job. And we're gonna see that we're gonna come up with the predetermined um, application rate, and that's how we will attribute them to any one job. Now, what happens when we are running our costs through our accounting system, they will be reported on the balance sheet as work in progress. They will be reported on the balance sheet as finished goods. And then as they are sold, they go from the balance sheet to what? Uh, to the income statement. We run those through our accounting system, okay? So one of the challenges here, shouldn't be too much of a problem for you guys, I find my introductory to managerial accounting students have trouble because they get confused. Well, what do you mean? Is it product cost or manufacturing cost or is it direct material, direct labor, manufacturing overhead? My answer is yes. What do you mean factory overhead? Is it indirect materials, indirect labor? Yes, but it's also what? The other indirect costs. So we have different names for the same things, okay? Okay, good. Now you come over and that's a pretty good little um, introduction there to our product cost. And you can see that our product cost, and now I'm just looking at the book here, are our manufacturing um, in our, our also product costs are also, I'll put up here just to keep this uh, AKA manufacturing cost. Did I ask you to flashcard that up there? Yeah, I did. Okay, so that's all right. Also known as what product cost, okay, are our direct materials, our direct work labor, and our manufacturing overhead. You don't have to flashcard it twice, though. I'm just showing you here in the textbook um, that that's saying the same thing. Now, we can also have period costs. Period costs are expensed. If period costs are expensed, that means they go straight to what? Uh, straight to the income statement. They are expensed in the period in which they uh, are incurred. They are not inventorializable. In other words, they never hit the balance sheet. They go straight to the um, income statement, okay? Now, when you look at our period costs, they include selling general and administrative costs. These are considered period costs and they are going to be expensed as incurred. They go straight to the um, income statement, okay? Okay, good. Now, when you look, as we've said, we have what? We have our manufacturing costs. They're treated as product costs. We've said that now a couple of times. You're probably getting sick of hearing that already. Our what? Our period costs, our selling and administrative expenses and whatnot are considered non-manufacturing costs. Here we go again. Now we are using a different term to describe something that we've called period costs, but we can also call them what? Non-manufacturing costs. So non-manufacturing costs, period costs, they are going to be expensed in the period incurred. And then we have our product cost. Our product costs are direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead. They do what? They sit on the balance sheet until we sell those items, those products, and then they go to cost of goods sold. Okay. Question. Okay, not a bad exercise here, guys. I don't know that we have to go through this together, okay? But you might want to take a look at that. I'm just going to say review for homework in which you go ahead and they start to ask you to go and look at these different costs and group them into whether they, you know what, we can do it right here. Why not? How about wages for factory employees? Um, is it product or is it um, going to be a period cost? I guess that's what we're doing here. <clears throat> product. Yeah, that's going to be a product cost because is what the key word there is what factory, right? Wages for the accounting department. What do you think? Period. Good. That's going to be a period cost because that's an administrative cost, right? How about sales and promotion expense? Period. 
good. How about raw materials purchased? Product. Product. Okay. How about general administrative cost? Period. Good. How about manufacturing overhead? Period. Product. product. Manufacturing overhead is a product cost. Direct material, direct labor, manufacturing overhead is product. How about interest expense? Period. Period. That's not even an operating expense, right? Okay. And then uh, I think that's it. And then they give us a solution on the next page. Now, something very important because they said here um, manufacturing overhead. They didn't call out any of the specific specifics. What if it said rent depreciation on administrative building? Period. That's period. So even though I said notice before when I wrote in, I said what depreciation on factory building. So that's a exam trick that they'll see you depreciation. You think oh depreciation is one of the other overhead costs, but if it's depreciation on the admin building, then it's going to be treated as a period cost. Okay. All right. Good. You can see the solution over there. So I think we got that all right. Okay, good. Now let's come over and let's look at our uh, product cost. Okay. And our product cost are what? Direct materials and our direct labor. Okay. Those are our direct costs, obviously. <clears throat> and then you come over and we have indirect costs. We have just coming over to the next page, we have our indirect materials, as we've already said. We have our indirect labor, as we've already mentioned. And then we have our other indirect costs, which I have already uh, given you a flashcard on, but let's just remind ourselves again. That's things like what? Depreciation, rent, property taxes. property taxes on what? All of these are on the factory, okay? What else? Utilities. What else? Okay, um, insurance. Okay, these kinds of things are going to be insurance uh, on the factory building um, would be an example of an indirect cost at factory overhead, one of the others, I should say. Okay, okay, now let's go ahead and let's talk some, oh, uh, here's the flashcard, I already indicated this to you, but I figured I'd just have you flashcard it here since they gave us this uh, pass key that prime costs include direct costs, direct materials, direct labor. Our conversion costs are direct labor and our manufacturing overhead. I don't know. And I get students sometimes, well, why is it? Uh, I don't know. Because some fool decided to put them in these categories. I really don't know. Because I stare at that sometimes. I'm like, well, who says? I mean, to me, it would have been fine to say that prime cost is direct materials and conversion costs or direct labor and manufacturing overhead and just leave it at that. That would have been fine for me. I don't know why they got to say that direct labor is a prime cost. Okay. Somebody just decided to do that. Okay. So you come over. So just flashcard that. You come over and we have what? We have accounting for overhead. Okay. Now, in a traditional costing system, which we're going to look at here, we will have a single cost pool. And we will apply, they say allocate, but we'll really apply those costs to our uh, work in process using a single cost driver. Often direct labor uh, hours is one that gets used uh, quite a bit. Now, in a little while, we'll say, well, you could use activity-based costing. And with activity-based costing, we have multiple Pools. They still call this ABC? Yeah. Sometimes you see it called um, 
what is that? I've seen it called um, time based activity costing. They, they give different names to it. Um, the problem that I have is a lot of the literature you see dealing with ABC now and dealing with time based. Uh, costing is to me, they are starting to blur the difference between the way accountants think about it and the way it would be used in a process management type of a situation. Um, because under time based activity costing or time based accounting, sometimes they call it, but it's not really accounting. What they do is they map very precisely how much time is taken at different stages in providing a service or whatever it is. And some of those costs are direct costs that they're very carefully tracking to each step in the process. And uh, to an accountant, that's not what I'm thinking of when I think of activity-based costing. I'm thinking of what? I have an overhead pool and rather than using one driver, I'll use multiple pools, one pool and one driver, I'll use multiple pools and I'll use multiple drivers. So instead of having one um, rate, I'll have several rates. And then depending on how drivers, depending on how a product uses up, that says drivers, depending on how a product uses up, those resources will determine how much we allocate to any one product. We'll do that a little bit later. That's something that's fairly light on the exam. We'll look more at that later. Right now, we're going to look at traditional. And with traditional, we have what? We have a, and guys, I'm going to put in here a predetermined overhead rate. By predetermined overhead rate, I mean we come up with an overhead rate for next year at the middle of the year before that, or at the end of the year before that, maybe that last quarter, based on past experience, we come up with a predetermined rate that we will then use to apply our indirect cost to all our jobs, all our products as we go forward, okay? So what do we do? It's predetermined and we take estimated, slash budgeted overhead cost and divide that by the estimated driver, okay? So this is what we think our overhead rate is going to be. Then the way we apply it to each job is we take that what? We take that predetermined overhead rate, okay? And we multiply it times the actual cost driver, say direct labor hours, whatever that is. And based on that, that's how we will apply our indirect costs to our jobs because it is difficult to trace those indirect costs, such as indirect labor, indirect material, the others, like the depreciation, and whatnot, uh, to our various products. Okay. So go ahead and, uh, yeah, flashcard those steps, marking it up the way I have uh, indicated. Okay. But I want you to go ahead, right? Let's go ahead right now. And we're going to do one together, and then I'm going to turn you loose on another one, okay? Where we're going to look at multiple choice question here, 0, 5, 3, 2, 1, okay? And then we're going to do... Um, sorry, Gary, so... I knew whichever one, other one I wanted to do, but now I forget what the number of it was. Um, and then I'm going to turn you loose on zero, five, seven, nine, eight. And these are question one in this chapter and question two. Okay. I think question one is on page uh, 13. And I think question two is on page 23. 
Okay. All right. So let's just go ahead and let's go over there right now. Okay. And I don't know why they buried those questions back there the way they did, but I think the good time to do them is right now. Okay. So let's do this first one together. This question 13, uh, question one on page 13 down here. Again, I'm giving the reference number. And um, you take a look at this. And we have this Jonathan Manufacturing adopted a job costing system. We'll talk more about job costing versus um, um, versus process costing here in a little while. Um, but with a job costing, you track your cost per job is generally if you're developing a unique product. So if I'm a cruise ship designer, if I'm a ship builder, I'm going to track my cost for a cruise ship that I'm making for a particular cruise liner company versus the cost associated. And I don't know that companies do both, but as opposed to the cost associated with a battleship, going to be very different, right? And so since each one is unique, I would track my cost by job, okay? But we sit here and we take a look and we say that for the current year, okay, budgeted cost driver activity levels for direct labor hours and direct labor costs were 20,000 for the hours and 100,000 for the uh, actual cost. In addition, budgeted variable and fixed overhead were 500,000 and 25,000 respectively, okay? So they have told us um, what, not 500,000, but 50,000, 25,000 respectively. So they've told us what they expect the overhead to be, and they told us what they expect the driver to be, right? Okay. Um, and they say here for a particular job, since we're using direct labor hours. So we know that the driver has to be direct labor hours. And sometimes students will say, well, why did they give us the uh, cost, I don't know, to distract you so that you would be able to read the question and know what you need to pick up here, right? So we have budgeted, what, 50 plus 25. So we have budgeted, we have estimated overhead costs of 75,000, the fixed and the variable. And then we need to divide that by what? By the budgeted, the estimated driver here, which we can see from down here, they want us to use direct labor hours. So we take that 20,000 hours, divide it, and we come up with the, what I'm calling the predetermined overhead. In this case, the predetermined overhead equals what? $3.75 per direct labor hour, right? Okay. Now, if I want to then apply that to this job, okay, well, the direct uh, labor uh, cost, okay, uh, for the uh, job uh, actual cost incurred for the year and um, they want us to figure out how much should be applied to this job that they're asking me about. Well, since it used what? 1500 hours, and these are what? Now, these are the actual hours. I will take that what? Predetermined overhead rate of 375, $3.75. And I will apply that to this job, whatever it was job number, they give me the job number here, but I'll apply it. And when I do that, I get what? I get this 5625. That's how I apply the overhead to indirect. Question. We grab the 20,000 from the budgeted cost driver activity. Is that correct for the um, bottom there? Yeah, that's where the 20,000 came from because um, you're using a predetermined rate. The actual number of direct labor hours um, is not relevant for become, coming up with that rate. Doesn't matter because I use that predetermined rate. Um, now, 
I apply the cost to each job using the predetermined rate. Of course, since there's a difference between what I had anticipated and what actually occurred, there will be an under or over applied overhead at the end of the period, but we will simply, we don't talk about that tonight, but we'll simply close that under or over applied to cost of goods sold. So if it's over applied, we'll go ahead and debit, uh, excuse me, credit. If it's over applied, we will, if it's over applied, we will credit if it's over applied, we will credit our cost of it sold and debit the overhead account to zero that out. If it's under applied, we will have to credit the overhead account and debit the cost of it sold. And in some cases, you may allocate that under over applied to cost of it sold work in process and finished goods. But that's not, we're not going to get into that tonight. Um, but that's basically why we use the 20,000, we use the budgeted. That's how we apply the jobs. Because think about it, you're not going to know what that 21,000 is until the year is over. Meanwhile, you've got jobs going on. So you need to be able to apply the overhead somehow to those jobs as they progress. Okay. Question? Okay, good. And then if that's the case, let's go over. And let's take a look at that other question I wanted to do, which is our second class question. I'm gonna let you do that one. When I say let you do it, I'm gonna go ahead and launch the poll and um, you can work on this one. Oh, by the way, um, on this particular one, uh, it's a little confusing. I, I feel, I don't know if the exam would do something like this or if it's just a typo on Becker's part, but I do want to point out that this 6,000 is dollars, okay? Uh, so um, not 6,000 hours, it's 6,000 or whatever. It's, it's what about 6, the 200,000? Is that also up above? Um, is that also dollars? Yes, they're both dollars. So I guess they think that we should know that the dollar sign applies completely for that entire column. Yes, that's also dollars. Okay, all right, go ahead. I'll let you take a look at this.
Okay, looks like uh, most of us have had a chance to look at this one. Um, about half of us got it right. Um, okay, I would have hoped we would have got a little better outcome, but let's go ahead and let's go through this one together. Okay, and um, let's just read the question carefully. Mary Company has two major categories of factory overhead, materials handling, and quality control. The cost expected. So there we go. That's our what? That's our expected. That's our budgeted, right? I wrote the word expected, budgeted. All of that means, hey, we're doing this in October, I don't know, and we're going to use of 2022, and we're going to use this rate in 2023. So we go ahead and we pick up the 120. I'll have to write those again. It's a waste of electronic ink, right? Okay, 320,000. Okay, so we know that our estimated is 320,000. And then we have to figure out, well, what is the what estimated driver? And they tell me, and it doesn't always have to be direct labor hours, guys. Be careful. Read the question carefully. They might give you, say, machine hours or something like that as the driver. Okay, but here... They're saying, yeah, direct labor hours is 80,000. So we put that in the um, denominator. And so we come up with the predetermined overhead rate. Okay. And the predetermined overhead rate here is going to be $4 per direct labor hour. Okay. Now they want to know what is the estimated product cost what are our product costs see how easy it is to forget the definition and get lost in the sea of these questions our product costs are what direct labor direct materials not necessarily in that order and what manufacturing mm -hmm. overhead well they give us the direct materials of the four thousand they give us the direct labor of 6,000, let's get the dollar sign on there. But we have to what? That's the whole point about indirect overhead is you have to apply it, right? It's $4 times, and we need to know how many hours they used on this job. And they tell us here in this parenthetical information that they used what? 2,000 hours. So using that predetermined overhead rate, we will apply the indirect cost, the overhead, because it's too difficult to trace it directly. So you have to apply it using the predetermined overhead rate of $4. So that's going to come out to what? To 8,000. So my total product cost is the four plus the six plus the eight, or the correct answer is we said 18,000. Question. area for you to pick up some good points on the exam guys okay this is one of those things that i think a lot of candidates look at it a couple of times and they get a little bit you know blurry eyed by all the different definitions and then have trouble with these kinds of questions you can pick up some points that are going to move you ahead um i think pretty nicely for your bec exam by following this process okay all right so we looked at that and um you know, I wanted to jump straight to the examples there of the questions um, as to how you would come up with that predetermined overhead rate and then how you would apply it to um, the different jobs. Okay, so let me find myself back. Hopefully we won't get dizzy here as we go through back and find what page we're on. Um, page seven. Page seven. Okay. We were living for a minute there, right? Michael, we were all the way to page 15, but we're, we're still back at page seven. All right. Okay, good. Now let's just go ahead and let's take a look at cost behavior. Okay. Now, cost behavior, and I don't know why they didn't give us a little chart for what. If I draw the chart like this, what is that? That is fixed cost, right? If the volume in units is down here, okay, and these are my costs, 
then a fixed cost by definition stays the same regardless of the number of units that I produce. Um, think about it, depreciation. Okay, unless I'm using, um, if I'm using straight line, yes. If I'm using units of activity, then my what? Then my um, my depreciation might actually have a variable component to it. Okay, but for these kinds of questions, they tend to treat depreciation as a fixed cost. Okay, so what happens? Doesn't matter how many units I produce, the what? The fixed costs are going to be the same. Okay, if I'm a, a sandwich shop. And I have to pay rent on my shop, right? Well, the, the landlord is going to come to me and say, oh, did you have a bad month? Don't pay the rent. Well, I mean, during COVID, some of that was happening. But, you know, generally, you know, you got to pay the rent regardless, right? Okay. So we have our what? We have our fixed cost stay the same regardless of the number of units. Now, when we talk about variable costs, variable costs, and I don't know why we have to have two variable charts here, but anyway, variable costs do what? They stay the same. Um, they, excuse me, increase as our volume increases, right? More units, more labor, more materials you need, right? Okay. Now, maybe, oh, I see. They did one for, yeah, okay, like that's necessary. They did one for direct labor, one for direct materials, but they both work the same, right? Okay. Then what? Our total cost, okay, this one's total is going to be our variable component, right? But we're also going to have the fixed component. So what happens is the fixed cost really what? Push up our total cost function regardless of the number of units we produce. We're gonna have some fixed cost and then we start adding what? Variable cost on top of that to compute our total cost. Now you look at this and you say, okay, John, well, why is, you know, uh, eighth grade, uh, you know, wherever you learned this, I learned it in college, but why is eighth grade, um, you know, graphing relevant to me to be able to pass the uh, CPA exam? Well, if you look at that um, graphic there, okay, for the total cost, okay, what happens? That is a function that could be described by the formula that you're probably familiar with, okay? Y equals MX plus B, where B is what? B is the straight line, okay? M is what? The slope of the line. X is obviously the number of units, and Y is that total cost, right? This is my X. This is my Y, this is my B, and then the slope of the line would be the M, okay? Now, what happens? So what you could look at this and say to yourself, well, look, I could just change these variables into, or change these, you know, symbols, I should say, into, you know, the things I'm using the equation into something that's representative of what the heck we're doing here, which our total cost, which is Y, equals what? Our variable cost times the units, okay, plus my what? Fixed cost, okay? So let's think about this even more for a second. We could use this function to help us describe what maybe the units could be direct labor hours that we're using. Okay, the units could be our direct labor hours. And then what we could do is sit there and predict what our what, how our overhead costs are going to relate to the development of our product. And we can use that to come up with our predetermined overhead rate. Okay, now that's not necessarily what we're getting into here at this point in time, but we will be able to use things like regression analysis, like the high low method to actually predict what we think those overhead costs are going to be and then come up with a predetermined overhead rate, okay? So we'll talk more about that later, but uh, right now we're just really focusing on the way the costs behave as they fall into uh, these categories of fixed and variable. Now, for some reason, 
the CPA exam um, likes to get cute with you on how they talk to you about variable costs. Now, we've already seen that variable costs do what? They increase the more product I produce, okay? So notice here, and this is where the exam to me gets a little bit cute with us, okay? Variable costs change in total as we produce more units or they come down, we produce yes, less units, but they remain constant per unit, okay? So as production volume increases or decreases, the total variable cost will increase, but the variable cost per unit will always remain the same, right? The total goes up as you produce, but the per unit stays the same, right? Okay? Now, um, you come over and you take a look at fixed cost, okay? And what do they tell us about fixed cost? And again, they get a little cute here. Fixed costs remain the same in total. That constant line going across is going to remain the same in total, right? But they vary per unit as production volume increases or decreases. Fixed costs in total remain the same, but the cost per unit will decrease or increase respectively. Flashcard that. Now, sometimes students have trouble with that, but let's just go ahead and you know come up with an easy example. Let's say my total fixed costs are 100,000. And let's say I produce one unit. What's my fixed cost per unit? Not a, um, not a trick question. $1. Try again. 100,000. 100, 100,000. Okay, good. Let's say my total fixed cost, which they are supposed to stay the same, is 100,000. But now I produce two units. 50,000. Good. Now my fixed cost per unit is 50,000. Excellent. As I produce more units, my fixed cost per unit comes down, right? I'm going to go ahead and belabor the point because if you guys know, I like to belabor points. 100,000 occupational hazard being a teacher. 100,000 divided by what? Three units equals what? 33,333. Right. Okay, so that's what they're saying, guys, that as the units increase, decrease, the fixed cost per unit uh, will increase, decrease, even though the total stays the same for your variable. Okay, very annoying, right? For your variable on a per unit basis, it stays the same, but in total, it increases as the number of units increase. Okay, okay, you know, the exam likes to ask that because they know they can get you all twisted up in a question, you know, and that's the reason they like to ask that. Okay, now, um, long run characteristics, and they tell us given enough time, any cost could be considered variable. For example, and they use this term relevant range for that, okay, um, they tell us that, hey, yeah, factory depreciation is fixed until you produce so many units that you have to do what? Build another factory building. So in the long run, they consider all costs to be variable and that's what that means. And they use that term in the relevant range. So when you see that term, that's what they're talking about. In the relevant range, yeah, costs are fixed, but uh, the relevant range is just considering you're not have to build a whole other factory building. You're not gonna exceed factory capacity, whatever. Okay, so that's what they tell us. And uh, uh, oh, um, I'll show you where they formally call out relevant range in a second, guys. But let's just go ahead and let's take a look here. Semi variable mixed cost. Okay, so what semi variable mixed cost have is they have both a fixed and a mixed component to it. Okay. So what happens? Semi-variable costs, if we were to graph them, would look something like this, wouldn't they? Okay. So if that's the case, semi-variable costs look like that, then that could be describing what? 
could be describing my overhead. So my overhead tends to be semi-variable. For example, I'm not gonna write it down, but utilities. What happens? If you were to unplug all your appliances, turn all your lights off and sit in your house and not move for one month, would Pacific Gas and Electric still send you a bill? Yeah, they'd send you a bill just for the right to have the wire come to your house. Okay, so what happens? That's the fixed component of, say, utilities. Then what? Then if you start to plug things back in and turn on the lights and all that kind of thing, then what? Then there's that variable component. So when we talk about mixed costs, semi-variable, a uh, semi-variable cost, and you can put down here, tend to be overhead, manufacturing overhead. Okay, our semi-variable tend to be manufacturing overhead. And since we can go ahead and think about our manufacturing overhead cost as what? Well, some of them are fixed, depreciation. Some of them, like utilities, act like this. Um, you mix in there a little bit something like indirect labor, like a supervisor. That tends to have more of a stepped component to it okay so when you actually try to predict how your overhead costs will work you assume a linear relationship like this but the reality is is that it's not actually linear and when we talk about regression analysis you'll be able to see what the fit is between whatever you're determining the driver to be and your total overhead cost and regression analysis will give you a good sense as to whether or not that actually behaves in a linear pattern. And if it does, then you can go ahead and use that to predict your overhead cost, but we'll talk more about that later. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and um, we have this exercise that I don't wanna do because it's just annoying uh, that have you group the cost into whether they're variable, fixed or semi-variable. I don't feel like doing that. I, I don't know. I don't like that exercise. I think it's, it causes more harm than good. So I wouldn't even look at it. Um, there's that relevant range. Okay. So relevant range says what? Yeah. All costs, costs can be grouped into variable or fixed within the relevant range. If you go outside of the relevant range, a second factory building, yeah, then um, costs are going to be considered variable. Okay, good. So I like better, this chart does a better job, okay, of telling us what things are variable, fixed, and semi-variable. And guys, uh, I want you to shrink to fit flashcard or look in your Becker cards and see if you have this already. And again, we don't need to go through all of this, um, you know, together, I think you can kind of figure it out uh, as you go through the uh, process here, okay? Um, this is annoying. Well, how annoying is this? That's freaking annoying. I mean, I don't understand why if it's both variable and fixed, then why isn't it semi-variable? Okay, so um, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So I would have done it this way. I wouldn't have put the checks there. And I think it is worth noting from this here together that notice, guys, we could do it for what? We can do it for both our product cost Okay, and our what? And our period cost, both product cost, because I kind of talked about it all in the context of uh, product cost, manufacturing cost, but you could break them into your, your you, could, you could look at both period and product cost as fixed variable or semi-variable. Okay, question. 
Okay, good. Let's come over and let's look at this one question, which is again, I don't know. I don't know. I guess I'm getting too old for this stuff. I find a lot of this stuff annoying, but let's go ahead and let's look at this here um, for this particular question to see if we can remember our, some of our definitions. Okay, um, I'll give you I'll give you fifteen more seconds. I'm just give you a full two minutes. Okay, let's go ahead and look at this one, guys. Looks like everyone's had a chance to um, try it, and okay, uh, pretty good result, eighty percent. Um, you know, it said just sort of an annoying definitional question. Here, if product costs required a great deal of electricity to produce and crude oil prices increased, okay, assuming, I don't know, do they still use crude oil for electricity? I guess on the East Coast somewhere. Crude oil prices increased. Which of the following costs most likely uh, would increase? And you take a look. It's not going to affect our materials. It's not going to affect our labor. It's going to affect our what? manufacturing overhead right as we have to apply that electric bill and manufacturing overhead is considered what is considered a conversion cost okay okay good let's come i hear a question let's come over and let's start type talk taking a look at how we're going to accumulate costs okay and again we're going to look at uh, how to accumulate costs both in a job costing system and then we're also going to talk about it in a uh, process costing system okay so process costing is homogeneous goods like steel pepsi every can of pepsi is the same right those kinds of things job costing is used for custom order okay so if you're going to be uh, doing the landscaping at a hospital, your landscaping company, the landscaping at a hospital versus the landscaping at a personal residence is going to be different, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now, when we come over, they talk to us about the cost of goods manufactured. Okay. Now, here we go again. Um, right here with the cost of goods manufactured. Here we go again with an, an uh, a definition, okay, that is going to be extremely helpful for you to be able to answer any questions dealing with the flow of cost through a product costing or process or product process costing uh, entity, okay, company. Now, by definition, the cost of goods manufactured, 
by definition, guys, there's nothing else that needs to be said, okay? By definition, the cost of goods manufactured is what gets transferred out of work in progress to finished goods. That's it. There is no other meaning there for cost of goods manufactured. Purge any other thoughts of cost of goods manufactured from your mind. It is the amount that comes out of work and process and goes into finished goods, okay? Now, since I use T accounts there, that means the cost of goods manufactured could also be expressed as what? As the debit to finished goods and the credit to what? The credit to work in process? Since I use T accounts up there, could also be written that way. That also means that it could be written if I were to use account analysis format and I'm analyzing work in progress, then I would have the beginning balance. I add, and what do I add? to my work in process. I add my product cost. What are my product costs? Caught you napping. What are my product costs? Direct labor, uh, direct materials, materials, and manufacturing. Materials. Materials. Good. Excellent, okay. And then what do I do? I subtract. What do I subtract from work in process? Cost of goods manufactured. Good. Cost of goods manufactured. to give me then what? The ending balance? Okay, B, A, S, E. Do you see how they, knowing the definitions are critical? Because they may give you the beginning balance and they may say the manufacturing costs, the product costs are, the ending balance in work in process is therefore the cost of goods manufactured was boom, 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 plug in the numbers they give you, solve for the unknown in that example, cost of goods manufactured, right? Now they could do it this way. I could analyze finished goods and I would have what? I would have the beginning balance. What do I add to my finished goods? Cost of goods manufacturer. manufacturer. <laughs> cost of goods manufacturer. Very good, guys. Cost of goods manufactured. What do you think I would subtract? Cost of goods sold. Good. Cost of goods sold gets subtracted. I guess I should I'm gonna continue with the X's over here. Beginning balance. I'll write my X's over here. Cost of goods manufactured gets added. Subtract what? Cost of goods sold, whatever that is. And then that yields me what? The ending balance in the finished goods. So you look at that and let's say they give you a question where they say, well, the beginning balance, is, and they may give you, you know, a couple of different things. They may talk about work in process information too, but ultimately 
they ask you what is the uh, cost of goods manufactured here. Well, that would mean they'd have to tell you the beginning balance. They'd have to tell you what the uh, what the cost of goods sold was, and they'd have to tell you the ending balance, and then you can back into the end. No, maybe they'll in one problem make you calculate the cost of goods manufactured, analyzing work in process, and then give you a second question where they start telling you about finished goods and ask you to give them the cost of goods sold. Knowing the definitions and knowing how these things connect to each other is the way to crush those 15 points, guys, okay? Okay, good. So let's go ahead and they show us the cost of goods manufactured calculation in which you're trying to yield the cost of goods manufactured by having the beginning balance, adding my product cost, direct labor, manufacturing overhead, and the direct materials, okay? My product cost, right? They pick those up, they add those, and then they take out the what the um, ending work and in process inventory to yield you the cost of goods manufactured. I don't like that because I like sticking with the blank account analysis format because we use it for other things. So let's just stick with beginning, add, subtract, ending balance. So we just have to remember that's a way to analyze any account. I can do this for any account in accounting. Every account in accounting has a beginning balance. You add some shit, some stuff to it, you subtract some stuff to it, and you end up with the ending balance, right? So I'd rather stick with that. And then for the cost of goods sold, they kind of do that same, you know, uh, approach of, you know, giving the finish. We add the cost of goods manufactured, less the ending inventory yield, you cost of goods sold. But again, I would rather do BASE and treat the, um, you know, if I'm looking for the cost of goods sold, treat it as the subtract from the finished goods. Question. Okay, I think this is as good a point as any for a nice little break right here. And then we're gonna to start to talk about job order costing a little bit, and then we'll get into process costing with the big deal there being uh, equivalent unit calculations, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and um, let's just put uh, 635 so we get a full break. We could wait a little longer, but I can't get through that flow chart on the next page uh, with the T accounts um, fast enough and I wanna get to that. So uh, I wanna do that, um, but I, I want enough time to do it properly. So let's just give ourselves a little extra time for the break and uh, we will come back and pick that up. I'm going to pause the recording. So guys, please, uh, if I forget, uh, somebody alert me. Okay. Recording for us. Okay. And um, let's go ahead and start to take a look here at job order costing. And uh, as previously mentioned, um, with job order costing, each unit is unique or easily identifiable. So if we're building yachts, you, know, you don't mass produce yachts, okay? Somebody says, this is what I want my yacht to look like, okay? That you build it to specs, okay? That's what we mean by job order costing. Now, we're going to look here um, over at the uh, page 14, and we're going to be talking about, we already looked at that question, we're going to be talking about these journal entries here, these T accounts that are, you know, symbolizing journal entries that would be posted here. Um, you can use this in a process costing system as well. So why they're just limiting this discussion to job order costing doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because debits and credits are used to run costs through an accounting system. And, um, you know, how you do that is to debit some credits into these accounts. So I'm not sure why they're just limiting this to job order costing overview. It could also be used for process costing as well. Okay. Still got debits and credits. You still have these accounts, well, materials and so forth. Okay. Now, let's just go through, though, and I think it is worthwhile to kind of uh, follow this thing through. And I'm going to mark this up a little bit. And uh, I suggest that you go ahead and kind of do your best to stay with me to mark it up as well. 
Now let's start with raw materials. Okay, raw materials, um, you know, it's a good place to start here. And let's just understand how amounts get into raw materials, right? So what would happen? We would have a debit to raw materials when we purchase those. And then we would have what? We would have a corresponding credit to either cash or accounts payable. Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and assume that they're buying this stuff on account. And so, you know, you'd have the debit to raw materials and credit to accounts payable, right? Okay, all right, good. Now we have the raw materials and then we're going to requisition those materials into production and we requisition them into production we will have a credit to direct materials. Okay, you can see that credit there. And that credit then will what? Come down and be a debit to my work in process. Okay, as I start to add my what? My manufacturing cost, or also known as my product cost. Right. Okay. Now, some material is indirect, like the glue for the table or oil used to, you know, lubricate the factory machines. Well, if that's the case, I'm going to go ahead and I'm still going to credit, of course, my materials to take it out of the materials. But now it has to go to what? Now it has to go as an indirect material into my manufacturing overhead. And that's my actual overhead and I'll debit my actual overhead cost to my manufacturing overhead in this case indirect materials okay okay good so I'm sitting there and I've got my raw materials and no matter how many materials you put in a work in process unless you do what unless you apply some conversion costs like direct materials and overhead they're not going to turn into product right so now I go ahead and I can, I guess, use a, hopefully that, that's too dark. Okay. Now I'm going to go, I'll use this blue here. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to credit wages payable for my direct labor. That goes into my work in process, right? Okay. It's part of my product cost. Okay. Now what? Now I will also have some indirect labor. Okay. The janitors, the supervisor, whatever. I can't credit that. I, I credited wages payable, but I can't debit that directly to work in process. So I put it in my manufacturing overhead because we said that our manufacturing overhead is what? Indirect labor, indirect materials. And we have the, remember, I say the scary one is the others. Okay, I call those the others. Okay, which is what? Depreciation. this light green here we have what we have the depreciation on what on factory building and equipment right we have taxes on the factory insurance on the factory other indirect costs and i think it probably would have been worthwhile for them to include here good example even though we have a flashcard on the others utilities Okay, is another good example there. Okay, those are the others. Now, let's just think about some of the credits here. Okay, so the debit for the depreciation would be to the actual side of the manufacturing overhead, but we would have what? We would have the credit side. The credit side would be accumulated depreciation. So in a retail entity, you would just debit depreciation expense. Here, we would debit the manufacturing overhead and credit the accumulated depreciation, okay? Um, we would have what? We would have payables. Okay, so the credit would be to payables there. The debit to utilities could be rent. I'm just trying to squeeze rent in there, guys. Could be rent on the factory building, and we have the different payables, okay? Okay, so what have we done here? We've got our 
raw materials, we issued them into production. If it was direct, that went to work in process, added to the beginning balance for the direct labor, added that to my work in process. For the indirect items, we put those on the actual side of the manufacturing overhead, right? Now we got to figure out how can we get these overhead costs and apply them to the product. So what do we do? Well, now we go ahead okay, and we're going to use the, and we would use what? We would use the predetermined overhead rate. Predetermined overhead rate is going to be what? Estimated total overhead divided by the estimated driver, say direct labor hours, whatever that is, right? And based on that predetermined overhead rate, we will then apply the overhead to our work in process using that predetermined overhead rate. Okay. Now, guys, <clears throat> only in a textbook will these numbers match. Okay. The amount that's applied or the amount that is um, of the amount that is applied versus the actual. Okay. So if there is a debit balance sitting in this at the end, okay, that means we underapplied. That means we had more actual. Okay. That means we had more actual. And if it's underapplied to balance this to zero, we want to balance to zero. So to balance this to zero, if we have too much debit, we would do what? We would credit on the applied side, that balances it to zero. And now we would go ahead and do what? We would, and you could allocate it between the cost of goods sold, the uh, finished goods and the work in process, or you could take it directly cost of goods sold. If it's not material, you could take it directly cost of goods sold, but that would balance that out. And since you had what? Since you had underapplied, you had more than you applied. Yeah, your costs were more, weren't they? So you debit that to cost of goods sold, okay? If it was over applied, that means I put too much to work in process. The amounts I applied were more than my actuals. So now to do what? To balance to zero. Now I have to go ahead and do what? Now I have to credit this side. That balances to zero. And now what? Now, I um, mean, excuse, excuse me, debit, debit on the left, credit on the right, John. I'd have to go ahead and debit to this side to balance to zero. And now I'm going to do what? Now I'm going to credit cost to get sold. And that makes sense that I would credit cost to get sold for that because I need to do what? I need to take some cost out, okay? Because I put too much in, okay? So I have what? I have all of these costs that were added to my, work in process, the overhead had to be applied, but I have my total manufacturing costs that were added to the beginning balance. The subtract, the amount that comes out by definition is called what guys? Don't look at the book, look at me. Cost of goods manufactured is what comes out of work in process. There is nothing else that means. It's the amount that goes out of work in process and into finished goods. And then as I sell the stuff, I credit the cost of goods, uh, credit the finished goods and debit the cost of goods sold. Question. Okay, now, where are we going to report our raw materials, our work in process, and our finished goods? Balance sheet. Beautiful. Thank you, Michael. That goes what? That goes to the balance sheet. And then when it becomes what? A cost of goods sold, then it goes to what? Income, income statement. Good. Income statement as my cost of goods sold. Beautiful. Very good, guys. Okay. Now, is there anything else that belongs on the income statement? Sales. 
Well, okay, yeah, sales uh, from, an, from a cost standpoint, since we're talking about cost accounting here. Of the things we've been talking about. These are my product cost, aren't they? That was product cost that went to cost goods sold? Michael? Period cost. Good, period cost. also go what to the income statement so when you have wages payable if it was the ceo's salary if it was accounting right that's going to go what that's going to go straight from the wages payable and the debit would be to what i guess i should write that admin expense, whatever, selling and administrative expenses. And then of course would show up as a period cost on the um, income set. Good. Okay, question. All right, good. Now uh, you come over and um, they talk about process costing. And again, I don't know, you know, I guess they showed you this because you would keep track of these costs as they flow per job is why they were kind of trying to call it uh, job order costing. With process costing, we tend to think more of batches of homogeneous goods, but the same debits and credits would apply as you go from raw materials into work in process and finished goods and then out to uh, cost of goods sold. Okay, But when we're talking about process costing, we're probably going to keep track of those costs in batches, and um, it would be for homogeneous items. For example, you know, we have a bunch of, uh, uh, <clears throat> when I like to think of process costing, uh, there used to be this show called How's It, How's It Made? And they would show you the way they would like process different things. And it was amazing to watch how they would. And it was usually homogeneous goods. They did, rarely did how's it made with the job order costing was like the same thing. Or the other one that I think about one time, um, they used to do this thing where they would show Snoop Dogg um, the way stuff was made. And he would comment on it as it was being made. I think it was Jimmy Kimmel used to do that. One time they were showing him the making sausages. And he's like, oh, God, I'm never eating sausage again. <laughs> okay, so, you know, those kinds of things are going to be a process costing type system where every single thing is the same. Okay, now you can go ahead and flashcard. And sometimes my students will say, well, wait a minute. What about diet Pepsi versus regular Pepsi? Well, that's going to be what a batch, right? So we keep track of things by batches. Okay, now you come over and the big deal for process costing is this notion um guys i don't like this pass key thing um because i like the base beginning add what was purchased subtract and that gives you uh the ending well this is base but i've already given you these for i wrote them down earlier for finished goods and work in process so maybe i do like this thing because I already gave them to you. So I like this, but I don't think we need to do it again. Beginning, add, finish, but you should know these relationships. Okay. Okay, good. In fact, you know what? Here a minute ago, I said I don't like it. And now I'm going to tell you to shrink to flashcard. Actually, this is pretty good. I, I think the reason I uh, <clears throat> shrink to flashcard size. I think the the reason I kind of when I looked at it earlier, I didn't look at it carefully enough. Um, I thought I think I was thinking that it was more where they give you the way to calculate, um, for example, the um, cost of goods manufactured. But here they actually show it in the BASE uh, order. So that's actually pretty good. Except they don't call it inventory transfer to finished goods, they should call it what? Cost of goods manufactured. So maybe I don't like this. <laughs> so stick with what I gave you earlier. You're like, okay, John, you're confusing. I showed it to you earlier where you're using the terms cost of goods manufactured and stuff for that. So don't, don't flashcard this. 
Okay, now, again, the big deal when we talk about process costing is this notion of equivalent units, okay? And with equivalent units, what we're going to do is give ourselves credit for partial work done during the period, okay? And so they give you a good, easy example of how to do equivalent units. And they tell us here, well, look, if you sat there and you had 10,000 units and you decided that they were 75% complete, then you would act as though you had actually completed what? A full 7,500 units, okay? That's equivalent units, okay? Now, what happens is, and what makes this difficult for me sometimes is we have two different methods. There are two cost flow assumptions that we're going to talk about, two cost flow assumptions. One is FIFO, the other is weighted average. And depending on which of those methods used, how we're gonna calculate equivalent units is going to vary. And how we figure out the cost per equivalent unit is going to vary depending on which of these methods we use. And my problem is, I don't know why it is, if I'm looking at something and I'm understanding FIFO, I can't think of weighted average. And if I'm looking at something and I'm thinking of weighted average, I can't think of FIFO. I can't hold them both in my head at the same time. You're gonna have to be able to do that, okay? And so let's just first take a look at first in, first out method. And then we'll look at the um, weighted average after that, okay, let's just look at FIFO. And you come over and they tell us on the next page that when we're talking about FIFO and we're talking about calculation of equivalent units, okay, the equivalent units are the completion of units that were on hand at the beginning of the period. So often they'll say, well, the units on hand were 40% complete. Okay, at the beginning of the period. Well, what you would do to figure out what you did this period, work done this period will equal what? 100% minus work already done at beginning of the period. So for example, if they tell us that the goods were 40% complete at the beginning of the period, then how much work did we do this period? 60. 60%, good, okay. Then, and guys, the language varies from question to question. And so we're going to see, especially when we look at some of the questions, you're gonna to have to read carefully to know what you're talking about. If they say units started and completed during the period, then what? Well, we completed the units that were in the beginning, right? So really you would only wanna add now to get your equivalent units because you're gonna multiply whatever the units that were in progress at the beginning times, in this example I gave you a minute ago, the 60%, the work you did this period. And so what would you do? To get the uh, units um, started and completed this period, you would go to take the total units completed and have to subtract the beginning work in process because you already accounted for that in step one. Then, and the easy part really is to go ahead and figure out, you know, well, what are the units, equivalent units for stuff in progress at the end of the period? If they told you the stuff was 75% complete, you take the number of units times 0.75, right? That would give you the uh, equivalent units under FIFO. Now, the cost components, since we're only giving ourselves credit, the dollars, this is units up here. This is going to be the dollars down here because you're going, you're going to come up with a, a cost per equivalent unit. And so for the dollars, you would only pick up the cost added this period because you've only given yourself credit for what you've done this period, right? So whatever your direct materials, whatever your direct labor was, your and, and your overhead. And by the way, this is where they start 
calling it out as direct material versus conversion cost to make it a little easier so you don't have to sit there and do it for materials versus overhead. So they just call it conversion cost. But you have to sit there and you have to come up with your uh, your um, materials cost and your conversion costs per equivalent unit. And that number is going to be useful to allow us to run our numbers through our process costing system. And again, it's work in process, it's finished good, it's cost to get sold, uh, just like we um, talked about for really job order costing. Now, if you use the equivalent units method, I mean, the uh, weighted average method, excuse me, you will pick up the units completed during the month and it's whatever was in work in process, okay? So we take 100%, we actually give ourselves credit as though we did all that work this period, even though those units may have been in process at the beginning of the year. And then just like you do for the uh, FIFO method, then you apply the um, equivalent units percentage for the ending inventory. The cost component, so that's the units, the cost component is you pick up all costs added for the period plus whatever was in beginning inventory for the period because you're sitting there and saying, well, I did all that work this period. Okay. Okay, good. So we come over and let's just take a look at how we'll do the equivalent units under the two methods. Okay. And uh, I guess they start with FIFO here. Okay, it's always important to know what method you're using. We start with FIFO, and they tell us the work in process that was 25% complete um, at the beginning of the period, um, and they tell us that's 100 units. Units completed and transferred out. Now, if the question tells you the units completed and transferred out, then they're essentially telling you this is the equivalent number of units that you completed and transferred out for the period. Um, so we'll see how, oh, I guess we're not gonna do FIFO first. Sorry guys, I thought this was calling out FIFO first. First we'll do, um, that's confusing. First we'll do weighted average. And then we'll do FIFO. Okay, I don't know why they flipped those on us just to screw me up here, I guess. Okay, because they mentioned FIFO first and then they put weighted average first. But anyway, so let's do the um, weighted average first. Okay, so with the weighted average, we pick up what? Since they said units completed and transferred out are 600, that's saying, hey, we completed the 100 and then we what started up 500 more and we completed and transferred those out. So they pick up that 600 in that example. Okay. Now, some questions may say to you, uh, unit started. If that's the case and they tell you unit started, then you'd have to have the 100 plus whatever the um, units started and completed. If they say that, started and completed, then it'd be the 100 plus whatever the units started and completed are. So I can't give you a specific flashcard that talks about the way they're going to describe that part because it's it varies from question to question. Then you come over. And when we look at the work in process at the end, we just pick up what those 200 units times the 40% and we have our equivalent units, okay? Now, if you come over and you were to look at the FIFO method, we only give ourselves credit for what we completed this period on those first 100. So that's that 75, because it was 25% complete, 100% minus 25% means we completed 75%, 75% units started and completed this period is 600, but we already accounted for the 100 units, didn't we, up there that we had started? So to get the units what? The units started and completed, you have to actually do what? Back out those 100 that we already counted for up there and you get the 500, okay? Some questions, may just say uh, units 
started this period, uh, I mean, some questions may tell you units completed and transferred out, and they'll just give you that number. So it really varies by question, and you have to get good at reading these questions, understanding what the hell they're trying to do to you, what they're trying to tell you when you look at these, okay? And then we get what? And then we get the work in process uh, is the 80, and so we get a different answer if we're using the, um, the equivalent units versus the um, FIFO, okay? Now, in this pass key, okay, um, yeah, I ain't in love with this pass key because the language changes from uh, question to question. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play play with that pass key. But this pass key, yes, I do want you to flashcard that because notice what. They tell us that for weighted average, it's whatever the beginning cost was plus the current cost for FIFO, because we're only giving ourselves credit for what we did this period, we only pick up the current cost. Okay. Now you look at all that, and then they give us an example here. Okay. So you can see that we're going to use FIFO, we're going to use weighted average and compare them. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do uh, weighted average first, and then we'll do FIFO. So guys, hang in there with me. This might not be a bad time to really have your book in front of you. So you can kind of flip back and forth to the facing pages. I'm going to have to scroll up and down since I don't have a way of showing you two pages at once here. Okay, but let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this and they tell us, and let's just focus for a second on what they tell us about the um, units in process at the beginning for materials is 100% complete for conversion costs, it's 40% complete, okay? And then they tell us the number of units, okay? Now you come over and let's just look at the weighted average. Let's just look at the solution. Okay, so we're first going to do the equivalent units using weighted average here. Let's do that first. And they told us that they were 100% complete for everything, but notice, well, they told us that they were what? Let's go back. That for the uh, materials, they were 100%, but for conversion, they were 40%. But notice that what? For the weighted average, you give yourself credit for everything you did this period, right? Okay. Then what? Then they come over and if we look at the language here, they tell us units started and completed this period, which is 10,000. Okay. And those are 100%. So they go ahead and they do what? They pick up those 10,000 for the units that were started and completed. The 4,000 weren't what? weren't started this period, right? Now, if they sat there and they just gave me what? Just gave me units completed. Well, then I would have to, whatever that number would be, I'd have to subtract out those 4,000. So it varies by question, the way I see that articulated. Then what? Then we do the equivalent units. And since they told me that for what? For materials, they were, um, you know, um, 100%, but for conversion, they were only 80%, right? I have to go ahead and apply that 80% for the uh, conversion cost, and that gives me the units there, the 16,000 and the 15,600, okay? Now, for the dollar portion, that's the units, right? We have to calculate the units, but we also have to calculate the dollars. And for the dollars portion, notice we pick up what? We pick up the, um, the costs that were in the beginning inventory. And we pick up what? The costs that were added for the period, for the conversion cost and for the labor. So we go ahead and we pick up both of those. Okay, And when we do, let's just focus on well, let's just look at the materials for a second. We get what? We get that 25,000, okay? Now, I don't know that the book makes this as clear as I would like it to, but what would happen? We would take that 25,000. 
we would divide it by what? We would divide it by the 16,000 equivalent units for materials. And that gives us this number, which they're putting at 1.56. Guys, the number is actually, if you put that in your calculator right now, you'd see 1.5625 is the number that comes out uh, when you uh, actually calculate that. Okay. And then for the conversion cost, the labor in my overhead, I take what? I take the 52,000. And I'm going to divide that now by what? By the 15,600. And that's going to give me, and I think that comes to, what's the irrational number that you get on that? Um, 3.3333. Oh, okay. So it's 3.33 is pretty, is pretty Pretty close enough. Okay. Okay, good. So you get those two numbers. Now I know what the cost per equivalent unit is, right? Well, what am I supposed to do with this number? I mean, I have this number. Now what? Okay. Well, what I have is this situation. I have work in process. That's why I said those T counts, they shouldn't have just limited those to uh, um, or job order costing because they still have the same set of accounts that we're dealing with. I have what? I have my balance and I have what? I have a thousand dollars in my work in process, don't I? That was the beginning balance, thousand dollars. And I know from, and guys, I'm just looking at materials here. I just want to look at materials because I don't want to turn this into a three hour example. Okay, so let's just look at the materials here. I know that for my direct materials, they added what? 24,000. So the balance went up to 25,000, didn't it? With me so far? They added 24,000. Nope. So huh? Did you say something, Eric? I said yes. Oh, okay. Okay, good. And then um, what happens? Well, some of the stuff got finished, didn't it? And transferred out. So that means I need some amount that's going to have to come out of work and process and go into finished goods, right? How am I going to do that? Well, if you look, if they, and I'm just looking at materials again, guys. If you look, they did what? They had 4,000 units in process, they started another and completed another what? 10,000, um, and then there were what? 2,000 units that were left over at the end. So the units that got transferred here were what? 14,000, the ones that they, they already had and the units they started and completed. So I take that 1562, and again, I'm just looking at materials here. And I multiply that times the 14,000 units, the ones that were already started that they completed and the units that they actually started this period and completed, that's the 14,000, the four plus the 10. And when I multiply that 1.562 times 14,000, I get 21,875, give or take. Okay, well, I'm saying that's the amount of costs for the units that got transferred out, the ones that I had in the beginning, plus the units started and completed. So I would credit 21,875, leaving me here now a balance of 3125. Okay. Now, sometimes a question will ask you, well, what's the value of the amount that's in the uh, ending inventory? And if that's the case, I have to do what? I'd have to go ahead and pick up the number of units that are left there, which is what? The 2,000 units that are still there times what? And I'm picking up the 2,000, of course, because they were 100% done as material. 2,000 times what? Times that 
six two five, and that come on, that then gives me what the three one two five. So you know, in practice, you might go ahead and calculate that number as a check figure, but it actually comes along with the journal entry, doesn't it? Okay. So the only reason I'm doing this part up here, I mean, probably many, many exam questions would stop here, or many, many exam questions would go ahead and say, well, what's the cost of the units transferred out? Or they might ask you the cost of the ending inventory. They might ask you those two numbers. They probably wouldn't start using the terms cost of goods manufactured and that, but that is what that number is, right? And that's the reason we went through this exercise, okay? Now, if you're dealing with first in, first out, okay, that was the um, weighted average method. If you're dealing with first in, first out, now what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to sit here and notice, guys, I don't give myself any credit for that work because they were 100% done with materials, right? I started, uh, units started and completed were 10. That's the 2000, they were 100% done as to materials, 80% done as to conversion costs, okay? Then what? This is the big takeaway. I only add the cost that I added this period because I am not giving myself credit for anything I did this period. Oh, I probably left out something important there. Notice they said that for conversion, they were 40% done. So I do what? I take one minus the 40%, and so I multiply for the conversion. I do multiply those 4,000 units times the 60%, right? To get the equivalent units. Whereas under weighted average, I gave myself credit for all of that oh, for this period. Thus, why I added those costs from the beginning inventory. I then go ahead, and just as I showed you here, I would take what? I would take the 24,000. Divide it by the what 12,000 units. Gives me the two dollars per unit, 49,000. I guess we right to divide it by the 14,000. And then I would proceed accordingly the way I showed you in terms of transferring those costs over. Question. Okay, good. With all that. Let's go ahead and we're going to come back to these other things, but I see no reason to delay looking at our class questions tonight um, that will um, contemplate equivalent units. I'm going to let you do these. I'm going to go ahead and put up the poll.
Guys, I'm giving you a little more time on this one. We want to try to wrap this up. We're going over three minutes now. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, make our selections. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. And um, okay, we have kind of mixed results here. Um, of the choices, the I don't say the majority, the largest number that came in, 45% came in for the correct answer, which is B, um, but we're you know not getting a majority of the folks aren't getting it right. And certainly we're not at the high level of 89% correct that I'd like to see here. So let's go through this one and let's look at it. And it gets, you got to build up some muscle tissue with these questions, guys. They're not easy. Okay. So you come over and we have this Kerner manufacturer and um, the following information summarizes operations uh, during the quarter. And then they tell us the beginning work in process was 50% complete for direct materials. Ending work in process is 75% complete for direct materials. What were the equivalent units of production using the FIFO method with regard to materials? Okay, so they're just giving us the materials here that we have to deal with. Of course, we'd also have to do conversion costs. Um, you know, if we were actually doing this, right? Now they tell us we're using the FIFO method. So under the FIFO method, we're only going to give ourselves credit for what we did this period, right? So if we had work in process of what a hundred, and those units were what. 50% complete, then 100% minus the 50% means that we only did what? 50% of the work this period. So we're going to multiply that times 0.5. Or for the beginning inventory, we're just going to give ourselves credit for 50 equivalent units for the beginning. Okay. Now we have to figure out what was started and completed. That's our next thing, right? What did we start? What did we complete? Okay. And so you look and they start using some funny terminology here, or they can kind of mess, they're a little hazy on the terminology. That's why I told you, you got to read the question carefully because they say units started during the quarter. Well, that's not started and completed. Then they tell me units completed during the quarter. Well, that includes those hundred that I just accounted for, right? Because they did complete those, those period. And then they give me the ending. So I look at this and I'm like, well, since they're giving me the units completed at what? To get started and completed. Started and completed. And since they did what? Since they tell me that they completed 400, well, there's the 400 minus what? The 100 that they also completed was already in beginning inventory, right? So started and completed becomes what? Not 300,000, but 300 units. Another way to look at this, although I like to look at it this way, would be say, well, if you started 500 and what the um, units that were still in process were 200, then you must have what started and completed 300. You can look at it that way too, right? Okay, so that's what I'm saying, guys. You got to sort of get used to reading these to understand what's going on. I can't really give you a flashcard because they don't use the same consistent term across questions. Okay. Now you come over and then you have the ending inventory, the equivalent units, which is the 200. And they tell me that they were what? 75% um, complete. So I'm gonna give myself credit for that 75. And that gives me, this is always to me, kind of the easy part that gives me the 150. You total that up, that's the 500 equivalent units. Question. Question. Pain in the ass, right? So what was that thing you mentioned in the very beginning about the, since this is FIFO and the 100 units in the beginning, I think you said we wouldn't use it if it was the other method. Is that 
Well, if it's the yes, if if this was weight, that's a good question. If this was weighted average, we would have given ourselves credit for that entire 100. Okay. We wouldn't have weighted it by the 50% if this was weighted average. And they may do that. They may ask, so it would be 100 units. So what would that come out to? Uh, 550 units would be the answer for weighted average. And, and in a question, they may do that. They'll say, now do weighted average. Okay. All right, good. Let's look at the next one. This is good work, guys. This is this is what you need to be doing. This is how you pass the CPA exam. Doing what? Crunching through stuff like this, especially the stuff that's, you know, gets a little bit involved. You could see a task-based simulation that might ask you to do some things with this. So you really need to be good at this stuff. Guys, are you okay? I'm only seeing three. Uh, Ant three. You need. Uh, do you need a life preserver here? This one's a little harder. Yeah. You need more time, or you want me to come in and save you? I'm just not getting an answer. That's one of the options. I'm doing something wrong. Yeah. That that generally is a problem. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, let, 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 you know, there's no need for you to sit here and, and struggle, um, you know, in the quicksand. Let, let's, you know, I'm going to end the poll. 
go ahead and take what you think is the right answer. Okay. But um, let's go ahead because I don't see any reason to see you squirm. Well, okay. Well, I'll give one more minute to you and your gallant crew. Okay. Let's see if you can. Because we're we're getting there. It's just a little slow here. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and wrap this one up. We're coming up on five minutes now on this question. And again, um, you know, most important thing is for you to have um, accuracy at this point. And so I apologize for maybe pulling the, tr uh, the plug on you a little too early because we got a pretty good turnout for what is a pretty tough question, 80%, okay? So let's just go ahead and look at this, but you give you all this information and then they want the weighted average method for equivalent units. Now, when you see that, and they're asking me the unit cost, I know I've got to have some dollars in this answer. I see that all my choices have dollar signs. So I'm going to have to have a dollar answer. So I better look at these dollars. And I know that if I'm using what? Weighted average, I'm going to give myself credit as though I did at this period for any work that was in progress at the beginning of the period. So, and they're asking me for materials. So, the first thing I would do is pick up the materials information, the materials dollars. And I know that those material dollars are going to be in my numerator in calculating my cost per equivalent unit, right? So the first thing I would do is pick up those two numbers so that by the time I'm, you know, coming out bloodied on the other end for the equivalent units, the harder part, at least I got that squared away, right? Any question on that? Okay, then the harder part is getting, getting the equivalent units. Now they tell me that the beginning work in process was what? 16,000 units? So I give myself, for the units part of it, I give myself credit for all those as though I did them this period. So I pick up 100% of that for the beginning, right? Then they tell me what was started in production, and then they tell me what was completed in production. Well, if I want to get what? I always have to get the units started and completed. for that next part to get the unit started and completed. And if they did what? If they completed 92,000, but I've already counted for what? The 16,000 that were um, already started at the beginning of the period because I already counted for those 100%, then to get the unit started and completed is going to be, what's that, 76,000? Okay, so take the 92 minus the 16, or I like to look at it that way. But another way to look at it is, well, if I started 100,000, okay, that doesn't include the ones that were already in progress at the beginning that I've given myself 100% credit for. But if I started 100 and what, 24 are not completed, then I could get the 76 that way as well. Okay. Then I have to figure out for the ending, and it's 24,000. And they tell me in the problem information that the ending inventory was 90% complete for materials. So I go ahead and I take that 24 times the 0.9. That yields me, what, 21,600? I did my math right on that. And so you go ahead, you add those together. That gives you the 113,600. You put that into the denominator, 113,600. 
that gives me the correct answer here, which is what, 460 per unit, which what, 80% of us got correct, okay? All right, not the easiest thing in the world. Nobody wakes up in the morning saying, oh boy, I hope I get a bunch of equivalent unit questions on my exam, okay? But you do need to be ready for this wonderful subject, okay? Question. Okay, good. All right, let's go back because there was um, some things that we skipped past when we came to the question here. Um, basically, spoilage. Okay, what happens? It really becomes a definitional thing. Okay, and when we look at spoilage, spoilage can be normal spoilage. If it's normal spoilage, we're going to take the cost of those items that we spoiled. And we're just going to roll it into our total cost divided by the number of units, and that's going to be our cost per unit. And so we'll treat it as inventory as we transfer that cost per unit out of my work in process into finished goods. Okay, if it's normal spoilage, it's just part of cost of doing business. Okay, so it's an inventory cost. Um, let me catch myself. Let me throw myself back. Okay, to where I was. Okay. Um, if it's normal spoil spoilage, it's an inventory cost, flashcard debt, okay? Now, if, okay, it's abnormal spoilage, we treat that as a period expense, okay? Reason we treat abnormal spoilage as a period expense, we had some weird thing that happened that we're not expecting to happen again. And so we're going to want that to hit the income statement to reflect it in the period that it happened. Okay. Now you come over, and that's the main thing I want you to flash card, but just look at this example. Okay. And you can see that they go ahead and we have what? We have these pies that we're making. I always hate when they use food examples and I'm hungry. Okay. But we have these pies, 20,000 pies that we're making. And they want us to figure out what the cost per pie is, okay? So what happens? We pick up just the cost of everything but the abnormal spoilers. So if you added all this up, okay, you would get uh, the pie. Okay, here it is, pie ingredients. Maybe a better way to do it is this way, pie ingredients. Yep, you pick that up. The, uh, the baking labor, we pick that up. The 11,000 of um, sales and marketing. No, no, what is that? Where's that? Yeah, this is hard to read. Prediction, oh, production overhead of 11,000. And the what? The normal spoilage of the 400, right? They take that number and they divide it by the number of these are the good pies here. Okay, we have good pies of 20,000, so my cost is $4.02 per unit, and I'm going to run that through my work in process, finished goods, and ultimately you won't hit the income statement until cost of goods sold. Period expense, well, we already said that what? Sales and marketing is a period expense. We've been saying that. General and administrative, we've been saying is a period expense, and it's kind of like, really, all that just to get me to remember that what? That our um, abnormal spoil is a period cost. Something happened in that period. It's abnormal and we don't expect it to happen again. So it needs to hit the income statement in the period that it occurred. Okay. Okay, good. Come over and uh, let's take a look at what do we have? Our next model. Okay. Yeah, I think I can. You know, I could try to finish it, but I'm going to be rushing us to the end, and I don't want to do that. And I think that um, we may be able, we'll definitely be able to finish this chapter next time, and we will be able to um, jump into chapter four as well. Okay, so I think we'll be able to catch ourselves up here 
at some point. Unfortunately, we had to miss last week. So I want to stop there. It's another 20 minutes, but I'm going to be cramming way too much. And I just don't like to start you in the middle of a module because then you can't really do that module. And then you got to wait till next time after we've talked about it. So, so I'm going to I'm going to call off the dogs there. Go ahead and conclude the class right here. We will pick up with module three next time. So at this point, you should be able to uh, work through probably the more important two modules of this uh, chapter, which are the first two modules that we talked about tonight. Okay. Question. Do you mind posting this lecture onto the, I'm totally blank on the name of the portal, but, um, so that we can review it again later. When you say, do I mind doing it? You mean like tonight or something? You... Um, I mean, this week, if it's possible. I'll try. I mean, I, I have everything else caught up there. So I'll try to get this up there as, as soon as possible. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yep. Okay, guys. If there's nothing else, I will see you on Tuesday next week. Be getting into your homework, guys. Don't. Let me jump in using Vector Navigator and see that you've completely abandoned the homework, okay? Okay, guys, I'll see you soon. Thank you. Have a good Thank night. Thank you. Have a good Thank night. You. Good night.